I'm Ashley Hay, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Ashley Hayes. We knew it would be bad, but there are levels of bad. There was no scale that could have measured this one. Residents listened as 130 mile per hour winds tore away their roofs and struggled to stay alive as water crept into their homes, threatening to drown people in their living rooms. When the winds died and the rain finally stopped, the streets were only navigable by boat. The death toll rose to over 70 and more than 1 million cars flooded with an estimate of $100 billion in destruction. How does a community, a city, a state survive when hit by a monster storm and then have every square inch covered by over 4 feet of water? A storm which can only be described as a 1,000 year flooding event worse than Hurricane Katrina and broke all historical records lived through one man's experience as the world grew more and more uncertain. Experienced through the medium of social media, the day-by-day visceral experience of watching people's lives permanently altered, and the heart-filling moments when strangers, neighbors, and friends stepped up and helped those in trouble. Watch as needs are met, lives preserved, and hope restored in the two months following Harvey. Get your signed paperback copy of Two Months with Harvey by Terry R. Hill. Go to terryrhill.net. Proceeds from this project are going to benefit people still struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. terryrhill.net. Two months with Harvey. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. I'm really excited today to bring you author Ashley Hay. Uh, Ashley has a brand new book uh, out. Well, here in the States, it's brand new. Uh, It's been out for about six months in her homeland of Australia. It's called A Hundred Small Lessons. And uh, I was just joking with Ashley before we started recording that uh, I actually got my copy of the book in the mail today. You may have seen me post it on Instagram and and Facebook. And uh, I was riding around with my wife doing some errands and made myself car sick because I didn't want to stop reading. Uh, so, you know, that's when you know it's a great book, when you're, when you're willing to sacrifice, um, you know, your, your health for it. But <laughs> welcome to the show, Ashley. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to make you feel queasy earlier in the day. Oh, you know, it was, it, it was self-induced. So, you know, I, I really can't blame you. Um, but, you know, Ashley, before we get into all the good stuff we're going to talk about today, uh, we begin each show with the same question. And we have to do that before we can move on. Uh, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I always, I have very clear memories of being a reader. And I think, as probably a lot of writers would say, it was reading that sort of got me down the rabbit hole in the first place. The first uh, book, if you like, that I can remember writing was when I was about five years old and my dad used to tell me stories about a character called Percy the Parrot and his friend George the Goanna. And when I was five, I wrote a, you know, stapled together paper book about Percy and George going to the circus, I think. Um, So that's the earliest thing I can remember writing. I probably was in uh, late high school when I started to think about whether it was possible to actually do this thing for a kind of a job. Um, but, yeah, the the earliest thing that I tried to put together with pages and, you know, a cover and all that exciting stuff was Percy the Parrot when I was five. Uh, and uh, which publisher picked that up? 
<laughs> uh, that would have been the very, very small press. We had a very limited edition run of one, um, which has operated out of my parents' stapler in the kitchen. So, uh, yeah, that was that was the beginning of it all. I, I love it. Um, Ashley, there are some very deep um, recurring themes on the show. And, you know, we're... We're getting close to 300 episodes uh, here at the first of the year. We'll hit 300 episodes. Um, So more than 300 authors we've had on the show. And, you know, you start detecting patterns when you talk to this many um, people who write down the things that the voices in their head tell them. Uh, And uh, one of those is this, this really deep recurring theme of people, you know, sitting at the kitchen table and making books of their own when they're, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, too small to, um, uh, you know, to, to know any better. And yep. uh, it, it's this fascinating thing that um, books are, are kind of magical to kids or, or at least to certain kids. You know, you get uh, you get these things, they, they, they have these characters and these stories and they transport us to another place. And, and so we sit down and want to create them for ourselves. And uh, I, I love that, uh, you know, the idea that um, a kid says, well, I'll just create one of my own and, uh, and and it'll be a real book. Exactly. And it is a real book in that way. I think it's, you're right about them being magical. I think actually they're magical for all kids. Um, I think, uh, I think when kids first learn to read for any child, the sort of process of realizing that those those marks on a page that that you know up until that point you've relied on an, on another person to translate for you the the kind of process of understanding that they can be your doorway into all these other worlds and they can let you be all these other people i think that is um that's something that really strikes anyone who goes through the process i think and what fascinates me is that then there are the kids that really travel with that and who for whom reading and sometimes making their own books remains a magical thing and there are the kids who sort of peel off into other magical spaces as well but I'm watching my son at the moment he's nine and he and his friend have just got into making Mm -hmm. comic books and it's exactly the same process you know the sheets of paper the kitchen table the stapler Uh, we've got to do a print run of two for those because we've got to send one home to his best friend's mum as well but it's just that it's that lovely combination of it's watching kids understand the combination of the imagination where they can they can make a story do anything but something about control as well that you know they're actually setting this thing down and and building a world and I think that's one of the most amazing processes you can watch um my friend uh, Dave Rudden, who is an Irish uh, middle grade author, uh, mm-hmm. told me that uh, he does a lot of school functions and, and talks to kids. And um, he said it's it's really weird that if you if you talk to a handful of teenagers, uh, you know, and you and you tell them, you know, you could write a book, uh, you know, the the vast majority of them will kind of stare at their feet and they're like, oh, okay, maybe. Uh, but if you tell the same thing to a bunch of eight or nine year olds, they're like, well, yeah, I've written five already. <laughs> you know, there's absolutely, there's- and sometimes happens where you know some kids, you know, turn it off. But I think it's like um, it's like watching little kids work with. Uh, with science, you know, they are all innately curious. They are all innately question askers in the way that that science uh, requires you to be. And the interesting thing is then what happens to the kids that go, yeah, I can run with this and keep being it. And, you know, what sort of divides them from the kids who who give it up somehow and and start um, opting out or kind of limiting that capacity. I think that's 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 really interesting. And particularly for people who write, kids books which I think has got to be one of the most fabulous professions in the world in terms of you know the impact that you might have on someone's life Um, that's a really interesting thing to tease out why things work and and why they don't work in a very different way to the way you're thinking about it when you're trying to make books for grown-ups exactly exactly um did your did your parents uh recognize uh this thing in you and and did they encourage it if they did uh, my parents were very encouraging uh, in, you know, I think they would have encouraged me whatever I wanted to do. Uh, I'm an only child and I think possibly that's what made me such a particular kind of reader because I think there's a bit of a correlation between 
only children, um, you know, sort of disappearing off into places where there are other people. Uh, my mum has memories of me entering writing competitions when I was in primary school and I don't really remember, but she does, so that's great, so clearly I was. Um, when I got through into high school and was sort of finishing, heading towards the end of high school and starting to think about what I might want to do at university, this was in the late 1980s and we didn't have creative writing classes, uh, creative writing courses the way that we do now. And so I decided that I would try to get into a journalism degree. I thought if I learnt how to be a journalist and could get a job as a journalist, it might give me a chance to try out this writing thing and then maybe I'd kind of step it up from there and see if I could write something longer. And I'm not sure that um, my dad was really thrilled about the idea of me being a journalist, but um, I made uh, this sort of grand promise that I <laughs> couldn't have had any idea of how I was going to keep of saying, you know, I was I was going to write for, you know, good publications and, you know, long stories and not sort of little foot-in-the-door muckraking stuff. Um, and I was incredibly fortunate in the years that I did work for, as a journalist that I did get to work for some great places, but I don't know what sort of gave me the chutzpah to make that um, promise to my dad in the first place. Anyway, he was he was supportive of my decision and I went off and did that. And then I was very lucky with some of the editors that I came across very early on in the piece who were encouraging and not only gave me the space to write sort of longer work for a magazine, so longer non-fiction work, if you like, than um, lots of journalists get to write, but also encouraged the kind of other writing that I wanted to do as well. Uh, what, uh, what, what sort of journalism did you, did you specialise in? Um, I started off mainly uh, writing art stories, I guess, writing profiles. I really loved doing that. And um, the first, when I did my cadetship, I had to write about everything. Um, I don't drive. I still don't drive. But I can remember it used to entertain my parents immensely that one of the jobs I had in my first uh, journalism gig was I had to put together the best car guide for the magazine that I worked for every year. So that was great. Um, and that was sort of a very broad range of thing. But I sort of started to veer into, I guess, what you would call arts journalism. So profiles and, you know, pieces about big productions and um, those kinds of things. And then at a certain point early on, um, I realised that there were all these amazing stories that people weren't really writing about over on the science side of the fence. And like lots of kids, I think I'd been brought up to think you had to decide if you were a science bunny or a humanities bunny. And I saw myself clearly on the humanities side of the fence. But I started to I started to interview scientists and I started to write profiles of them and to write about their work. And that opened up this sort of other amazing, um, amazing kind of area to talk about people who are also working with extraordinary imagination and extraordinary creativity. Um, and whose stories sometimes aren't necessarily translated as much for the general public. This is 25 years ago, so I think that's really changed a lot in that time. But I then became this kind of interesting hybrid of, an, of a journalist who would happily, you know, try to put together a profile of a film star or an author, but would also happily put together a profile of, you know, Australia's leading weevil expert or something like that. <laughs> Um, in your your years working uh, in in journalism and, and putting together these um, uh, you know spotlight pieces and, and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, those years doing that? Uh, how did how did that equip you for writing fiction? Um, I think the most important skill that journalism gave me was just the kind of the kind of really pragmatic stuff about deadline and um and and very early on sort of being able to disabuse yourself of that notion that some some ethereal inspiration has to visit you you know that you can that you can sit at your desk and wait weeks for a, for a beautiful muse to arrive and inspire you you don't get that in journalism you've got a a set piece of time in which you need to produce the piece and usually a set um word length as well, and the kind of discipline of those two things has been incredibly helpful uh, just in terms of showing up at the desk and doing the work every day. 
But the other thing that I think was incredibly helpful, and particularly from the science writing, uh, was just starting to understand the mechanics of how you how you can really hook a reader into a story. So thinking about the fact that if you tell someone you're going to write a story about a molecular biologist and they're quite, you know, seemingly obscure pieces of research, most people will sort of glaze over and think, well, this is nothing really to do with me. But if you can, if you can kind of animate the scientist in a way and, 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 and draw your readers into what excites them about their work, um, you know, how they came to it, what the kind of bigger story is there. And then also find for your readers a sort of a metaphor or a, um, some sort of really, uh, really, um, I don't know, unscientific is not the right word, but maybe maybe metaphor is the best one, a kind of metaphorical description of the work that's going on. Give them an image or give them an analogy of what the experiment or what the, the study is actually trying to do you really start to bring the story to life in a way and you start to you start to give a reader who might not have thought that they were going to be interested in what was on a page, you give them a way into that. And in terms of a novel, that's, I think, what you're always trying to do is to, to bring a set of imaginary characters in an imaginary world to life for people that you can't stand next to and say, well, what I was trying to do here was this or I was really hoping you'd think that when you read this. Passage. So I think those really basic sort of storytelling and, and crafting tools um, have been incredibly important as I've sort of gone on from writing more nonfiction to, to sticking my toe in the fiction pond. Uh, you, um, you wrote a, a few nonfiction uh, books uh, as well, didn't you? Uh, yeah. As you, uh, what, what were the, uh, I think The Secret uh, was one, yep. what was that book about? Um, the Secret was the first book that I wrote, so nothing like uh, setting yourself a challenge as a, a debut or author. It was a book about Lord Byron, you know, about whom just a little has been written before. Um, so it was a book about him and his incredibly short and um, sort of melodramatic marriage to a very, very proper young lady. They were married for... I think it was about 16 months and uh, she left him, which was very dramatic in 1816, as you can imagine. And he sort of fled the country and went off and had the life of being Byron. Um, and she kept talking about this and thinking about this and writing about this for the rest of her incredibly long life. And no one really knew what had happened um, to break up this marriage. There were so many theories and so many bits of evidence and, um, it was a sort of a, it was a really nice kind of mystery puzzle to to get your teeth into. Um, and that book came out, I am astonished to realise that book came out 17 years ago now. But it was a great, um, it was a great kind of, it was a great way of learning how to think about structure. You didn't have to think about the characters and the place because they were given in that way. But I had all these interesting questions to solve about you know how you how you make the the sort of momentum of the book flow. How you kind of build the peaks and the troughs. You're dealing with a very short, sharp piece of time in one way, but in Lady Byron's life, you're dealing with decades of time. Decades of time after Byron himself is dead and can't really have an opinion anymore. So it was a really lovely way to sort of start to explore writing in a longer form. So taking that step up from you know, four or five thousand words to sixty-five thousand words, and and starting to understand how you could move your characters around and how you could move time around and those sorts of things. Um, so that was the first book, and then there were uh, uh, three other non-fiction books after that. Before I sort of got brave enough to think, right, I'll I'll um, I'll try this next big thing, which was the thing that I'd always really wanted to attempt, which was writing a novel. Well, um, about the secret, uh, the Australian said if Jane Austen were alive and working as an investigative reporter, she would write a book like The Secret. Um, so it sounds like your writing has always had this kind of literary bent uh, and uh, that that you uh, have kind of been a master of storycraft even, even across the genres, which I love to see in an author. Oh, thank you. I think that quote from the Australian is 
You know, it's the sort of thing you should have on a T-shirt so you can wear it <laughs> on the clothes when you yes. doing one. What on earth you're doing? Um, yes, it was. A, it was a beautiful one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what brought you over uh, to the other side of the fence to writing fiction? Uh, well, as I said, I'd always wanted to play over there, and I'd written short stories, um, or from the time when I was in university, and and I I uh, published a couple of those, a few of those, when I was in my twenties, and then wrote these nonfiction books. The um, so after the secret, I wrote three non-fiction books. One uh, was a standalone uh, book about Australia's very iconic trees, uh, the eucalypts or the gum trees. And then that led me into two collaborations with this amazing Australian um, photographic visual artist, Robin Stacey, and we did two books together after that. And they were, but they, all those three books were sort of, um, they were kind of different explorations of colonial, Australia's colonial history through the prism of its natural history. So the the, the early scientists, the botanists, um, the the collectors, the the artists, all these people who'd sort of come to Australia and and worked with the flora and the fauna that they found here. And in the process of uh, working on those three books, I came across uh, a man called William Dawes who had come to Australia on the first fleet, which was the the first sort of uh, suite of ships that were sent out from England to establish a penal colony in what is now Sydney. And William Dawes was sent out. He was sent out uh, as one of the one of the soldiers. But he was tasked by the Astronomer Royal with setting up an observatory in Sydney. And he did this. They're one of the first buildings built in this, you know, scruffy little mess of tents was an observatory, which I found really amazing. And I got very interested by William Dawes and I, I think I sort of developed a bit of a crush on him and I started to wonder how I could uh, how I could build a novel around him. But, you know, when you haven't done something before, I think that's often when you, when you take risks that later on you might be too smart to actually launch into. So rather than just trying to write about William Dawes, and he is a character who's sort of quite well known over here, he appeals to a lot of writers, um, I, met, I built his story into two other strands of time. So where, the, where his observatory was built is at the southern end of where the Sydney Harbour Bridge sits now, which is, you know, one of our largest and most iconic things in this part of the world. So I started to imagine a story that would somehow connect William Dawes and this amazing observatory that he had with this extraordinary bridge that was built on the same site, you know, about 130, 140 years later. And then I started to think, because, of course, it's not hard enough lacing together 1788 and the late 1920s in a story, and I thought, well, clearly what I need to do now is throw in another story which exists in some kind of notional now and connects these these pieces of time together. And so that book uh, became a story called The Body in the Clouds, and the print, which just came out in the U.S. Uh, six, about five or six months ago. And the premise of that book is during the Sydney Harbour Bridge, this will be, you know, familiar to all um, builders of large bridges in America as well, several, uh, several men fell to their deaths while the bridge was being built. And the great thing about the Sydney Harbour Bridge was there was one man who fell from the bridge and survived. And I just became quite captivated by the idea of this kind of miraculous thing Happening, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing if if something miraculous happened somewhere? What if it wasn't just the story that sort of hung around, but what if some kind of trace of the moment itself hung around? And what if, you know, not only did the people who witnessed this thing happening when the bridge was being built carry that forward, but what if William Dawes, who spent all his time, you know, looking up at the sky in that particular part of Sydney? What if he could kind of see it as well? And what if the person in this kind of contemporary piece of time could also sort of see it out of the corner of their eye? And so I tried to, um, to write a novel that laced these, these three different men around this one kind of miraculous event and, and in that way sort of tell a, you know, a kind of different sort of story about stories themselves and about Sydney and you know, things that I love about Sydney and about this this kind of quite special place, which is this one this one sort of spot on Sydney Harbour. Uh, 
Um, I I am fascinated by stories of uh, uh, where we've got uh, a a place, um, but that is represented in multiple strands of time uh, like this. And I I love also when uh, I love to explore uh, kind of how how place affects the writer and then ultimately the work. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of great books, the, the place actually becomes a character. And, and, uh, it, it sounds like in this, that, that Sydney and, and this, you know, this, uh, this particular place and event is, is definitely, uh, a cornerstone of the, of the story. Um, what is it about operating across, uh, multiple strands of time, uh, do you think it is that that resonates with us so much? I think as humans, we're sort of we're hardwired for we're hardwired to look for those connections, aren't we? I've got a, a friend of mine who um, is a professor of psychology, and he he's done quite a lot of work on on the things that that distinguish how our brains from, you know, from the brains of other animals in a way. And one of the things that he talks about is our capacity to tell stories in the first place to ourselves, but then to tell these stories to each other. But then the real kicker is that we can time travel with these stories because we can tell each other things from the past, but we can also tell each other things that we hope for or we dream about or we would like to happen in the future we can we have this capacity to kind of navigate time through our narratives in a really amazing way and I think it's a it's an innate thing in all of us to try to make those connections um, for us or for me in Australia our colonial history is incredibly short you know it's it's where are we now? Two hundred and thirty-ish years, um, and so much extraordinary change has been wrought in, particularly in the sort of metropolitan parts of Australia in that time. And it fascinates me that, you know, if you laid three sort of, if you laid the lifespans of three seventy-year-olds end to end, well, you only need those three people to get right back to the beginning of of this, you know, phenomenal kind of empirical imposition on the land. So I think that's part of the reason why I'm interested in in finding quite, um, you know, quite sort of uh, poetic or imaginative ways of looking at great change. And I think for us as humans, the stories are often the things that, that we use to anchor ourselves to other times and other places, but also, you know, to our own places in other times. When I look at the the three novels, at, um, Body in the Clouds and The Railwayman's Wife and now A Hundred Small Lessons, the new book, all of them are concerned in different ways with, with the ideas of stories sort of, you know, transmitting across time and with the sort of um, centrality of place to us in, in, in how we kind of, pin ourselves to the world somehow. If you would like to help support the show and keep all of this great content coming, please go over to hankgarner.com. Click on the link to advertise if you would like to advertise your product or services. Uh, if you would just like to donate something to the show, if you enjoy the, uh, the content that you get, uh, there's a link over in the right-hand sidebar uh, where you can drop a tip to the show. Thank you for doing that. Also, we'd like to thank our sponsors who faithfully support the show uh, each week. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, the very best in monthly pulp goodness stories that are strange and, uh, you know, are otherworldly. You can always count on something unique from Tales of the Canyons of the Damned. There's 20 episodes so far. Go pick them up. Uh, Also, thirdscribe.com. If you're an author, you know that you need an author platform to connect with your readers. Readers, if you would like to connect with your favorite authors, they're over at Third Scribe. It's a vibrant community that Rob McClellan and the good folks there work very hard to build a place where book lovers uh, can connect with one another. Go check them out at thirdscribe.com. Also, if you're looking for a great science fiction uh, read for this holiday season or maybe a gift for someone, uh, go visit my friend Nick Breaker. His new book, Essence, uh, 
uh, Septima, book one, uh, is one of the best that you'll find. Also, Galactic Satori Chronicles, there's two books in that series. You will not uh, go wrong picking up some excellent books by my friend Nick Breaker. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. Also, uh, at the end of the show, we're going to have an audio book clip, like we always do, from our friend Richard Gleaves in the Jason Crane series. Thank you for listening. Yeah, um, I, it seems to me that, that Australia and uh, the U.S. Are, are very similar in that um, our, uh, our, our countries, uh, the, the way we think of it now, are in essence uh, very close to the same age. Uh, and, oh. and that, uh, you know, um, th- that's, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, that, that we our our history is very short, uh, yet so much has happened in that short amount of time. And that you're right. You could take three people, stretch them end to end and, and cover just about the entire, uh, history yet, uh, monumental change has happened and, and 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 so much happened before we got here uh well, and i'm, I'm sorry think, go ahead yeah. i was just going to say that i think that's the thing it's the it's these sort of um these kind of colonial or quite imposed histories that are so so short you know in australia we have things you know we we know that that the his the, the sort of history the indigenous history of this place goes back 60,000 years and when you lay that, it's like trying to talk about, you know, dinosaurs to kids. When you lay the 60,000 years next to the 200-odd years, that, you know, trying to make, trying to, to sort of make an imaginative um, acknowledgement of that, I think, is is something interesting. You know, even just in in um, in 100 Small Lessons, the, the period of time is is quite short. It's about 70 years. But even being able to see how... The stories that are told in the one place across just those seven decades change so profoundly. You know, it's something as humans, um, change is always occurring around us. And, and sometimes we seem amazing at sort of adapting that uh, to that and seizing it and, and really running with it. And sometimes you can just feel us putting our brakes on and, um, and being sort of quite, quite kind of pulled up by it. Um, now you can sort of have those conversations in, you know, pretty, uh, heavy-handed philosophical ways, but if you can if you can um, unpack those ideas in a in in a story in a story of you know some interesting characters who are doing interesting things and things that your readers might sort of you know relate to or or find moving because they identify with them or they remind them of of other people or other situations. I think that's a really that's a really interesting place to play in as a novelist somehow without making it, you know, without trying to make it sound too um, dramatic or kind of overblown in any way. Well, well, that's the power of story, isn't it? That, um, that you can, you, you can, you can tell one that they tell someone that they ought to feel a particular way about a situation or, uh, or, you know, a period of time or whatever. But if you give them a character and you put flesh and bones on that character and you show that they're three dimensional and that they have hopes and dreams and, and love and loss and, and all of the human things that we have, uh, then all of a sudden we have transformed someone, transported them to another place in time and, and maybe transformed the way they think about things. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, what you're saying about this sort of the, uh, the flesh and bones, you know, that's part of what um, fabulous storytelling does is it gives you all those kind of sensory perceptions so that you you can feel what the, your character's feeling or you can, you can smell what they're smelling or you can see what they're seeing. And that is, um, it's just, that's, that's a really amazing sort of space to be able to, to play in, I think. And if you then... Uh, start to get the feedback from your readers that they have related to that. They've, you know, you've reminded them about the taste of something, or you've reminded them about the sound of something. Um, then that's that. It doesn't. It doesn't sort of get nicer than that. I don't think. Right. Um, so, so you moved forward, and uh, after that book, you wrote another one called "The Railway Man's Wife." Uh, what yep. was that story about? <laughs> 
Uh, so I, I borrowed this from a, um, I took a tiny piece of my own family's history. My, my father's father was killed, used to work on the railways and was killed in a railway accident uh, 50 or 60 years ago. And after this happened, his wife was given, um, as a kind of compensation, she was given the job of the librarian in the local uh, railway institute library. There used to be this network of amazing libraries um, in Australia and the books would all travel around by train to sort of, you know, fetch up in these little libraries that were often built on the railway stations themselves. Uh, and I loved this idea. I'd always loved this idea of that kind of compensation in a way. Um, and I'd known this story all my life. And then at one point um, when it was a history week here and they'd done some restoration on this little library building and my dad was asked if he would go down and sort of talk about his childhood memories of where his mother had worked and, you know, what the place had been like. And while he was doing this little speech, a train went through the station outside and I'd never realised before that um, in giving this woman this job, in giving her this compensation for her husband's death, she'd actually been required to work within about 12 foot of the sound of the thing that had killed her husband, like every day for, you know, almost 20 years. And I started to imagine how, how that would feel like to have on the one hand gone through this terrible, um, this terrible accident, this terrible tragedy, to have been given, you know, the means of supporting yourself and your family on the other side of it, but to have been required by doing that to work so closely to this, to the great big sound of these trains going up and down the tracks. And I think the, the sort of book sort of began from there. I was interested too in thinking about, um, and thinking about sort of accidental death after a time of, I'm, I don't want to say more automatic death, but after a time of warfare, so coming out of a period like the Second World War when there has been a lot of killing and dying going on, and whether it was a harder or a different thing to frame sort of single accidental deaths after that, when you you know, how that sort of weird accountancy worked. So I invented a woman. Um, I killed off her very lovely husband. I invented her child for her and all of that. Um, and I started to kind of explore her work as a librarian and I gave her as the sort of the two people that she meets in the library and the two people who become sort of central to the book are two men who have just come back from the war, a doctor and a poet. And the, through the sort of prism of her friendships with them and her conversations with them, you move through the first year of her, of her widowhood. Um, and so the book kind of came, kind of grew out of uh, out of all of those sorts of sorts of ideas. Wow, what uh, what what themes uh, did the story allow you to to dig into? Well, again, I think it was um, it was ideas of story and of of how we uh, of how we how we tell our own stories, I guess, and how we. Um, how we don't always see them clearly or we perhaps modify them or, or play with them subconsciously or consciously. Um, I also wanted to think a bit about love, how we love people and, and how that is perhaps not always um, as clear and as obvious a thing as um, we might think it is or as it, it sort of, you know, often gets laid out in, um, in you know, in other, in other narratives and other story forms. Uh, I was interested in, in looking at grief as well, which um, sounds a little heavy-handed for this time of my Tuesday morning, but um, I was just interested in looking at the way, the stories that we tell ourselves to sort of survive that and to navigate that and how this woman is the woman that I, you know, imagined for the book is living in quite a small community, how the community kind of, you know, steps into that and becomes a part of that and becomes a support in that how she uses the place itself to kind of navigate that first year, you know, how her daughter, who's only 10 in the book, is sort of making her own navigation of this loss. Um, but the other thing that I really wanted to do, and I didn't realise until I was some way into the book, is um, it came back to place again. So 
this story in my family um, actually came from a small village on the south coast of New South Wales about 60 or 70 miles south of Sydney called Thoreau. And that's where I grew up, where my mum and dad grew up, and I grew up very close to there as well. And when I first started to think about this story, I imagined that I would move it. Actually, I think, first of all, I thought I would just make up a place to set it in and, you know, and then I just thought it would be sort of somewhere else. And at a certain point, I realised that the geography of the rule was sort of part of the story as well. So it also became a really lovely way for me to make another place into another character and um, and sort of really celebrate this very, very small spot, which is, you know, has the, the ocean out on one side of it and this very high escarpment on the other side of it. And it just sits on this little kind of tiny little wedge of plain in between the, the mountain and the sea. Um, and that was a really lovely thing to explore as well. I haven't lived in that part of the world uh, properly since I left high school, so since I was 18 years old, although I go back and visit it a lot. But it was lovely to be able to kind of bring it back to life and bring it to life in an era that I didn't remember in the late 1940s um, as a kind of act of, you know, tribute and an act of imagination. That was a lot of fun. I love it. Um, because the story began uh, in such a personal way to you with a with a uh, a family connection and a, a story that was kind of handed down uh, to you in writing this book, do you feel like that you got closer to your personal family story by exploring these characters and and maybe what your grandmother uh, you know went through and had to deal with and did it did it kind of uh, bring that some immediacy uh, to you? I don't know. I was very conscious of not writing her story. So I um, I made a lot of decisions very early on about about my character and her circumstances and, and just her kind of her persona in a way um, that would very clearly distinguish her from the real person. And I also made a conscious decision not to research the um, the actual accident itself until after I'd finished the book. So when I'd finished writing the Rao Emmons Wife, I think it had already I think it had already been published here or was you know sort of in those last stages of um, preparation. It was only then that I went and um, found the coroner's report for this accident in the archives, in the state archives. And I was immediately struck by how much more brutal the accident was in real life than what I had imagined in the book. And that was interesting to me because I felt... I, I don't know whether my grandmother um, ever read the report herself. Uh, I, um, I, I know my father hasn't, but I, I was sort of interested that I'd obviously been, I'd almost been protecting my character in a way by, by sort of softening what the accident was that took her husband away, whereas the actual you know, five or six pages with diagrams and testimony and all sorts of things that were laid out there um, as the real thing was was much more was much more confronting. And I I was pleased that I hadn't read that when I was working on the book because it would have it would have made the book a much more brutal thing. And a large part of what the book ends up talking about is is sort of is survival not in a you know hanging on by your fingernails way but in a ah uh, not you know again it's that's as extreme not sort of immediate rebirth but 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 in a sort of way of of being able to find the next step of being able to take the next step forward and I, I'm interested you know I can only imagine this now my grandmother's been dead a very long time but I'm not sure if she had read the coroner's report I I have a harder time imagining how she would have been able to step forward from that. Um, so I was sort of pleased to have been able to spare my character, Annie Lachlan, that, that kind of that kind of confrontation, I think. 
Well, that's a, a really interesting um, uh, thing, Ashley, that, you know, sometimes we see – uh, maybe hear a family story, maybe see a, a news report uh, or, you know, something, whatever it is, triggers uh, this, this story idea. And, um, uh, you know, as, as writers, uh, sometimes if you stay too long uh, and, and you get too many details, it, like you said, it will change the story. And instead of yeah. just going with what your subconscious mind or your unconscious mind or whatever, you know, whatever that story trigger is, um, you start working out that story immediately. And, and sometimes getting too much information will, will change when it comes out instead of just being confident in what your, your, you know, what your mind is coming up with on its own. And I, uh, I, I think that's fantastic that, uh, that you, you held out to the, till the story was finished to, you know, get the real world details. Yeah, I think I was a bit scared of them as well. You know, I think I, um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the process of inventing these people, and I, I didn't want to tempt myself. I didn't want to tempt the journalist in me. You know, there would be, you would write a completely different book if you were writing the actual story of of what happened, and you would. I would also then have been. Um, really imposing on my family in a different way. And I think one of the things that I love about writing fiction is that you you might have the bones of something or something like you say, something might be sparked or triggered, but what you're running with are your your reactions or your instincts after that. You are immediately creating after that rather than than sort of piecing together. There are the most phenomenal works of just beautiful but forensic nonfiction that you can make. But there's something just wonderful about just jumping off that starting point and saying, okay, yes, I can, I can identify the kind of the real thing that this steps up, off from, but after that, well, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of in free fall in a way and, um, and I'm trying to make a new reality. I'm trying to make something that, that feels real to people who read it but that I know I'm, I'm not just literally, you know, lifting or tracing from, from life in that way. Right. Um, so that brings us to your, uh, your new book, 100 Small Lessons, or at least it's, it's new here in the States. Uh, it, it actually releases the, the end of November, uh, I believe. And, um, this, uh, this, is a, a, a different story yet. It seems to pull from some common themes, uh, that you've explored before. Um, you've got this, this dual storyline, uh, but that plays out in a very interesting way, uh, as opposed to just, uh, kind of time traveling, uh, in, in a couple of different lines, you, you bring these, these characters and these storylines uh, in a fresh way. T tell us a little bit about how the, the story came to be and what is the premise for 100 Small Lessons? Sure. So 100 Small Lessons uh, is set in Brisbane, where I live now, and the main character in the book is probably actually a house. Um, it's just a little unassuming weatherboard house. Uh, in Brisbane we have um, houses that are sort of built up in the air in a kind of way. They're on stilts, uh, partly to, you know, keep them cool in summer, partly because every so often a flood comes along. Um, so it's one of those little up-in-the-air weatherboard boxes and the 100 Small Lessons opens with um, the scene of, a, of an elderly lady, Elsie, who's 89 years old. And Elsie's lived in this little weatherboard house for decades. She's She's been there for, you know, more than 60 years. Uh, and she has, it's, it's the longest day of, the shortest day of the year, sorry, in, in 2010, and Elsie has fallen in her home. And it's it's one of those stories which will be familiar to a lot of people of an elderly lady falling and not being able to get up and kind of finding herself lying on the floor of her house for quite some time. Um, now, what Elsie doesn't know is that as a result of this fall, uh, she'll go to hospital, um, but she won't actually get to go home again. She'll then be moved to live in a uh, kind of, um, I'm not sure what you call it in America, like an old age time or a, a you know, a kind of supported care facility. Uh, and her house will be sold. And a new, a young family, a young mother uh, called Lucy and her husband and her little boy 
or move in. So that had Elsie's life in it for, you know, more than six years. And now it has Lucy's life, you know, coming in to sort of to make this new fresh piece of, of living inside it. And the premise of the book is partly uh, to explore how Elsie's life is sort of kept in the house. Again, I suppose it's like that idea in The Body in the Clouds, how, how moments leave traces in places and how Lucy might start to think about Elsie and to wonder about her life. It's also about Elsie's life as a mother in the kind of, you know, almost 70 years that we see of her experience of being a mother of twins and Lucy's just starting out being a mother. She's got a one-year-old boy when she moves to Brisbane and moves into this house and she's just kind of navigating not just the new space of Brisbane, the new city that she has to live in, but also this whole new kind of world of motherhood, this whole new country of motherhood. Um, and so what the book does is it, it, it not only moves through the two different times for the two different women, but it starts to look at the ways those pieces of time might actually intersect and the ways that their experiences might intersect. And the idea for the book came, we, you know, here's your, here's your real life starting point. Um, when we moved to Brisbane, we did buy a small weatherboard house from an elderly lady. And I can remember being um, out on the front steps with my son one morning and it must have been raining the night before. He was very young. And when he went down the steps and walked across the grass, I could see where his footprints sort of pressed into the moisture on the grass so that when he had walked on, the footprints stayed there. And I started to think, well, what if they weren't his footprints? What if I had come out of the door this morning and there had been footprints on the grass? Whose footprints would they be? And then I started thinking about, you know, if you had been someone who'd lived your decades of life in this home You'd had to leave it, not voluntarily, not even really knowingly. You know, imagine leaving your home for the last time and not knowing that's what was happening. Surely your your most human instinct would be to try to get back home. And so I started to imagine a character called Lucy who was, you know, a mother of roughly my age. And I started to imagine a character called Elsie who was a, a much older lady who had, you know, lived in a house like this for a long time. And I started to imagine Elsie wanting to come back and trying to find ways of coming back and thinking about whether that would be a literal thing or whether that would be an imaginative thing and, and thinking about how we how we all time travel with our minds, but how sometimes when you're older, the kind of lines between, you know, then and now, the past and the present, are maybe a little bit more porous, maybe a bit more permeable. And the book um, grew in a very kind of uh, organic way from from that starting point. How, um, w when you're writing a book like this, how long does it take for your uh, kind of pre-planning uh, before you actually set out to start writing the book? Well, you know, with 100 Small Lessons, um, I didn't do a lot of, pre-planning it was it was a book much like the body in the clouds a book that I found by writing it so um, the railwayman's wife had a pretty clear arc when I sat down to start working on it I, I knew roughly um, the span of time that I was going to work with and I knew some of the things that were going to happen in that time I didn't know the ending um, the book that I'm working on now the same thing I have roughly the arc you know the span the points but a hundred small lessons and body in the clouds I, I had to kind of um, I had to kind of splunk somehow, you know. I just sort of had to drop into it and see what was there. Um, and for that reason, it, it took longer than I perhaps would have hoped. <laughs> so I started. I, I wrote a short story first of all about the first time that um, the first time that Lucy and Elsie sort of intersect or start thinking about each other. Elsie going out of the house for the first time, Lucy coming in, and I wrote that story back in two thousand and ten. And uh, I, I sort of sat with it for a little while and it was probably uh, maybe a year or so later I realised I'd been thinking about these women a lot, that they'd really kind of, they'd really sort of colonised my head. And I must have been getting towards the end of The Row and His Wife by then and starting to think about what I would do next. And I thought, well, I'd like to go back and kind of find out who these women are, find out what happens, find out if Elsie is 
popping back to her old place or, you know, if Lucy's having some kind of strange, you know, tropical heat hallucinations about it all. Um, and so I started to work on the book then and on and off it took me, it, I could say that it took five years but it wasn't five solid years. There were sort of other things going on. Uh, but it was a, it was an act of sort of uncovering um, not just what was happening for these women but as I discovered them, I, you know, I discovered more about their husbands, I discovered more about their children, I discovered more about their other relationships and then because of the nature of the book and, and because part of what the book wants to talk about are these, these sort of points of connection that we all have and, you know, often we may not know we have, I then had to find the ways that all those different points intersected, um, you know, some quite obviously and, and some very, very subtly. So it was a different sort of work of um, accretion in the first place and then this sort of strange kind of shifting and settling to make sure that all those little points aligned enough but in not such a you know heavy-handed way that it didn't seem like it could possibly be real so it took longer um and I think my, my you know my clear reaction to that was to think when it was finished and I was sort of getting back into the next book right I'm going to know what I'm doing this time so I've got this you know for the new book I've got this huge sheet which is all you know, marked out and I feel much more in control. It'll probably, the legs will probably fall off it, but, you know, I feel it's the illusion of control is incredibly important at certain points in this. Um, when you when you have a book um, like the new one that's uh, 100 Small Lessons, when when it comes together and you you finally see how these characters' lives are going to um uh, what what the culmination of this relationship is going to be, or uh, you know when the when you see the the dual timelines come together, uh, it, you know is that an aha moment for you? And uh, what is the feeling like when you when you as the writer as you're discovering the story when it all starts coming together? Oh, it's magic! It's just amazing, and I think it's um uh, it's it's when you get you get these little glimpses of how how the subconscious work of the piece has been kind of going along while you've been doing all the hefting and shoving and, you know, bullying at the top layer. You start to see how, you know, something that you set up very early on in the piece, you can see where that thread is moving through the story even though you might not have consciously put it there. There's a, there was a beautiful um, piece that George Saunders wrote. It was when Lincoln in the Bardo was coming out over here in Australia and he talked about that the thing you have to do at the beginning of the story of throwing all the balls up in the air and the excitement of that but then, of course, the balls have to come down. And it's not just, it's not just the process of sort of trying to catch them that's amazing. It's when you start to understand that the story has been doing its own work in a way while you have been doing the other work. You know, you've got your eye on three balls and you're kind of bringing those into your chest and, you know, without you kind of knowing it, two of the other balls are kind of doing this crazy kind of figure of eight thing somewhere off, you know, in the left-hand corner. And it's, I think it's one of the most wonderful things. It's sort of, it's it's the moment where I, I kind of, trust the story in a different way of going I see okay so yeah that's right I put that thing there I made that character do that and yes I understand now that's because it folds into this or that's because it links up with that and I think each you know every, every um, long form piece of fiction has those things in it but with something like a hundred small lessons in, in a lot of ways that's what the whole book is about um, so there were just some some lovely things, you know. I would I would know that I'd left something hanging, but as I got you know closer to the end of the book, I would realise that it was hanging because it joined up to you know this thing that had just kind of come to light seven chapters on or something like that. So it was a really um, well, I think it's also a bit like childbirth. You forget how hard and painful it was, but um, it feels in retrospect like. This, this really exciting kind of uh, moment of process of discovery and, and I think it's been lovely, you know, hearing from Australian readers that it, it kind of works that way on the page as well, that, 
there are all these tiny little things happening and then some of those, you know, the way that they reflect and refract and connect further on in the book sort of makes it feel like its own world in a way. The, uh, actually, the uh, the book is um, uh, is addictive, and uh, you have really, uh, you know, woven some magic in this book. I, I I can't recommend it enough. The book is called A Hundred Small Lessons. It'll be out in America uh, soon. It's out in Australia already. Um, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you? Oh, they can find me, uh, well, they can find books in different places. Um, they can find things on my website. Uh, they can find, you know, essays and things turn up in different parts of the world from time to time. I pop up all over the place. But, um, yes, I, so I think the, the novel, uh, when 100 Small Lessons comes out of the US in, in late November, uh, all three of the novels will be there. Um, all at once, which is sort of particularly exciting. So if they want a lot of me, um, I'm there in a very concerted lump at the moment. I love it. I love it. Um, Ashley, thank you so much for taking time out of your Tuesday morning to come on the show. Hank, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. He was just seven when his parents died. Eliza received the news of their death on Halloween morning, but she kept it from Jason for two more days. She sent him out trick-or-treating. He was a vampire. He spun around in the living room, eyes wild, shouting, I am the living dead, and wondering why they didn't laugh. On November 2nd, after school, Eliza told him. His parents were dead. It was a bleak time. He wanted silence. He wanted darkness. He cried great, rolling tears. In early spring, he ran away from home which means he stole five dollars, put a box of Cheez-Its in a pillowcase, and walked seven blocks. He slept in a field, glad to be miserable. He wanted to freeze to death, to be with his mom and dad, to not feel anything. His grandmother found him at a playground near the river, fallen in the dust with his shoulder against the slope of a teeter-totter, the other end riderless, suspended. He saw her trudging up the hill. She looked twice her usual size in her winter coat, and frightening. Let's go home, Jason. He knew he was in trouble. He knew what home meant. It meant a paddling or worse. Eliza opened her big winter coat and, straining, slipped down into the dust next to him. She drew him into her warm body, wrapping him in the coat. She flipped the collar up, rubbed her hands together, and cupped them over his ears. Purr! You're an ice cube, but it feels good, kinda. It's good to get really cold sometimes. Wakes you up. They were cheek to cheek against the teeter-totter, bundled together as the sky turned from gray to orange. The ground stung, but they sat a long time. Why? The word was just a tiny puff of vapor that slipped from his lips and into the wind, but it was also big big and heavy. She knew what his little boy heart had asked. She understood the universe of longing and confusion and hurt in that one whispered word. We all die, baby. In all the long, long history of the world, there's not been one of us who didn't. I'll die, he said. It wasn't a question, but it was. Yes. And I'll die, a lot sooner, and the why is just, it's just there. It just is. We're not around to see what was before us, and we're not here to see what happens after. The trees on the edge of the playground shivered with dawn. But we're here now, she said, and pulled him tighter until his cheekbone felt sore from pressing against hers. And it has to be enough. It has to be. Look at all we have now. Really look. He really looked. 
It was just a small playground off the main road of an unimportant New England town. But in the distance he could see the wide Kennebec River, and the sky was pink above it. He saw small ships moored, trimmed in red and baby blue, rocking against the current. He saw a robin on the railing of a dock, toes pointed inward, making occasional hops that were also flight. The town was waking up. There was a light in the bakery and one in the grocery. There was an empty can of beer on a picnic table and wildflowers by the road. There was wind and trees swaying gently. There was his own breath in his own lungs. There was his grandmother, her body, her heartbeat against his back as he leaned against her chest. There was his own life and hers and a world to live them in. And it was enough. 